Today's video is going to be a bit personal. As promised on my last video, I said that I would share my investing philosophy with you. And I'm going to do that on today's video. Now, I share my philosophy with you not because I want you to do what I do, but to let you see how someone else does it. So I'm sharing this really for educational purposes, not because I want you to copy me or mimic me, but just to give you a perspective of how someone else does it. Each of us has to develop our own process. And I would even go as far as to say the key attribute of your investing philosophy needs to be one that keeps you engaged in the process, one that is interesting to you so that you're continually growing and figuring out better ways to improve your philosophy. It doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be interesting because we all know that if we are not engaged in the investing process, then we are likely to fall short of our personal freedom goals in the long run. So being engaged, being interested in the process is key to success. So why do I select the stocks I select and why do I choose certain companies over other companies? Well, it's because my investing decisions are based on my philosophy. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. If you're new to the channel, my name is Kevin Burgess. I retired at the age of 55. Now, when I say retired, I don't mean that I stopped doing things. I now am able to do what I want to do, the things that are interesting to me, the things that keep me motivated and growing in life. So I, I don't really call it retirement. I call it personal freedom. Some examples of that are we've uh, bought a farm in Alabama and we've begun to homestead. So we've been growing uh, chickens and bees so far. And um, if you stay tuned to the end of the video, I'm going to share with you a video of the bees this morning. We went and did uh, some inspection of the bees and they got a little rowdy. So I want to share that video with you. Also, we've been traveling a lot. We went to Egypt back in June and also um, early in July, we were at the beach in South Carolina. So, so we're doing a lot of traveling. We're learning a lot of new things, learning how to grow animals, learning how to care for bees and chickens and those kinds of things. And again, if you're new to the channel, I'll give you a little bit of background on me. Part of my career gave me experience in SEC filings. These are the filings that public companies file with the SEC for investors. These are things like the 10Q, like the 10K, like the 8Ks, those types of filings I was responsible for. So that was a great experience level for me. And also part of my career was in the area of risk and internal audit, which gave me an interesting look into the financials of a company. Both of these roles gave me a unique position with both senior management as well as the board of directors. So I've been able to see how a company runs, how it operates, how decisions are made, and have come to realize that that's a key part of investing. In addition to that, from an educational perspective, I passed the CPA exam. It's been a long time ago, but I did. And then uh, I also got an MBA from The Ohio State University. And then lastly, something that I find to be really interesting, I hope you do as well, I was actually elected to be chairman of the investment committee for my employer's investment funds. There were about $14 billion of funds that needed to be invested for various purposes. And this committee was responsible for getting those funds invested. Obviously a key part of that is understanding markets, understanding funds, understanding managers, understanding portfolios. So there was a lot of education that went on there. So I take my, my work experience and I take my education and I take the education I got from the investment committee. I'm kind of rolling that all together and putting together a portfolio that is going to work for me in retirement. So if you're looking for solid ways to build a portfolio that not only provides a, a good total return over the long run, but also helps you sleep at night, consider subscribing to the channel because that's what we're about here on this channel. So we've got a lot to cover today. So let's get started. So what do I mean when I say investing philosophy? What I mean is, is that there's a theory 
uh, or attitude held by a person or organization that acts as a guiding principle for behavior. So what I, when I say investing philosophy, what I mean is this is the philosophy that kind of guides my decision making. It, it guides my uh, choice of stocks that I'm going to buy. And since I like to communicate using illustrations, because illustrations to me simplify the message so that we can cover a lot of ground pretty quickly, I'm going to start with a, with a view, uh, with a picture, an illustration of what I believe my philosophy is all about. And it really is basically about an intersection. So I came up with this picture from the internet of an intersection. It's not a four-way intersection, as you can tell. It actually has several. It's got five uh, intersections to it. And I want to walk through how this picture depicts what my philosophy is of investing. So I like to say that my investing philosophy is really at the intersection of several roads. What are these roads? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the first road is dividend growth investing. You probably have heard this term a lot if you've listened to you know, YouTube videos on dividend investing, but let's take a deeper look into what it means. So dividend growth investing, it entails buying shares in companies with a record of paying regular and increasing dividends. So the dividends these companies pay on an annual basis would go up each and every year. That is what dividend growth investing is all about. It's also inherently a long-term investment strategy. It takes time to work because the goal really is consistency, not quick profits. Now it's dividend growth investing that seeks companies that have been paying and growing their dividends on an annual basis over a long period of time. And so there's some categories that have been developed by dividend growth investors when they're seeking companies to invest in. These are known as dividend achievers, dividend contenders, dividend aristocrats, and dividend kings. Now, the dividend achievers are those who have raised their dividend for 10 years in a row or more. And then dividend contenders are companies that have raised their dividend between 10 and 24 years. Dividend aristocrats have a little bit of a different uh, take in that they need to be a part of the S&P 500, but they are a part of that S&P 500 as well as having increased their dividends for the past 25 years. And dividend kings are companies that have raised their dividends for more than 50 years, 50 consecutive years. So as a dividend growth investor, you're looking for companies that are falling into some of these categories so that they're growing their dividends over time. I put on the slide here an example of a company that I actually invest in. It's called Atmos Energy, ATO is the ticker symbol. You can see that uh, there's just a chart here that shows their growth of their dividend. And that's a nice up and to the right chart. You can see at the bottom of this uh, of the slide that uh, you know I've got what thirty nine years of not only a dividend streak but an uninterrupted growth streak of thirty nine years. So they've been paying their dividend for thirty nine years, and it has grown every year for thirty nine years. You can see here their latest increase was eight point eight percent. Um, they averaged for the last five years, 9%. And over the last 20 years, you can see back here in the, you know, 03, let's say to 2014 timeframe, it's pretty slow growth. So over the last 20 years, they're at a 4% uh, growth rate. But the point is Atmos Energy is a good example of a dividend growth company. So we know the first street on an intersection is dividend growth investing. So now let's move on then to the next street in our intersection, which is called value investing. Now, you may have heard uh, of some people talk about famous value investors like Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett. Uh, but what does value investing mean and how does it differ from dividend growth investing? So let's take a look at the next slide. Value investing is an investment strategy that involves picking stocks that appear to be trading for less than their intrinsic value. 
Value investors actively ferret out stocks. They think the stock market is underestimating. It's probably uh, best to look at this chart at the bottom of the screen. You can see the left-hand axis is the share price. The right-hand axis is time. The red line indicates intrinsic value and the black line indicates the market price. Now, the theory here is that market price doesn't always match up with the intrinsic value. There will be times where there's a lot of negative news for the company and, and people will begin to sell off their shares while other people are, are trying to buy into them. And then there will be times where there's great news about the company and they are buying the shares and there's a lot of momentum behind those shares. So they will end up buying them and, and driving the price higher than the actual intrinsic value of the company. So you can see that depicted on this chart here at the black line. When the black line is higher than the red line, the price of the company is what we would call overpriced or sometimes you hear it called overvalued. And then on the uh, underside, when the black line is below the red line, it, it is typically considered to be underpriced or undervalued. I've put an example up here. I do not own Walgreens Boots Alliance. It is uh, ticker symbol WBA. But I thought it would be interesting to see uh, Morningstar's valuation, uh, price versus fair value. You can see that uh, you know, this red line is what Morningstar calculates over time as their uh, fair value or the, what they would call fair value, but it's really the intrinsic value. The black line here is the pricing of Walgreens Boots Alliance. So you can see that over time in the first, maybe uh, from 2013 through uh, 17, let's say, Walgreens Boots Alliance was trading at above what uh, Morningstar had as their fair value. But as their strategy came under question, they began to um, you know, lose uh, market price. And also, interestingly enough, their fair value declined as well. So you see here in 2023, Walgreens Boots Alliance is well below it, it, its uh, stated fair value. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see that uh, it's trading at what they call a 24% discount. That means that, or at least that was on July the 12th, their last close was at $30.32. Their fair value, they say the fair value, uh, Morningstar would say the fair value is $40. So uh, $30 divided by 40 is 75%. So they're at trading at a 24% uh, discount or 25% discount. So value investing is looking for stocks that appear to be trading well below their intrinsic value. That means that the market has, has maybe moved on and is looking at other places for, for gains. And, and so there's a, a stock sitting there that has a lot of intrinsic value, but the price in the market is low. Those are the stocks that value investors want to, want to buy. Okay, let's look at the third and final road in our intersection, and it's called strategy and execution. So strategy and execution for me are really important because while a business may have performed well in the past, their future may or may not be the same. As shareholders, we are not buying the past of a company. We are buying their future performance. So how can we get comfortable with management decision making? So let's take a look at this slide here. Uh, I show an example of Johnson & Johnson. So first of all, Johnson & Johnson has a tremendous product line. Now this actually, I believe, includes Kenview products. So Tylenol, Motrin, uh, and those kinds of things, probably Aveeno, all of that first section will be the new Kenview company that is being spun off. But the point is, even in the worldwide pharmaceutical sales, they have Xarelto, Stellara, you know, Tremphia, drugs that we've heard a lot about, and then maybe it's because they're advertising well. But either way, it's, it's, uh, it's, they're drugs that we've heard a lot about. They've got some really high tech med tech sales as well. So, you know, we've got knee replacements and, and things along those lines. So Johnson & Johnson brings a lot to the table when it comes to the product lines. So when I'm looking at strategy and execution, I'm looking for well-branded products and services, barriers to entry, which uh, Morningstar would call a moat. 
And I'm looking for growing financial performance to support a growing dividend and then a solid strategic decision making. So how can we get comfortable with the management decision making uh, at a particular company? Well, one way that I look at is their capital allocation process. So, for instance, how are they uh, are they growing their dividend every year? And if they're growing their dividend every year, how much of their capital are they also putting to mergers and acquisitions or or research and development? And, and share buybacks because this is really about a balance, right? It's not just about sending all of the money back to the shareholder. It's about uh, not killing the golden goose. It's about growing the golden goose so that so that the golden goose lays bigger and bigger eggs every year, right? So capital allocation is a real key to me on how management makes decisions. I also can look at their mergers and acquisitions. Do those mergers and acquisitions um, line up with their strategy? How A third way is how do they handle crises? If they had a crisis in their business, how did they handle that? Did they handle it well or did they handle it poorly? What kind of succession management do they have in place? How are they growing their future leaders? I also like to listen to the earnings calls to see how they interact with the analysts. So obviously this is not uh, a numbers-based thing. It is based on judgment. But those are the kinds of things that I look at to give me comfort around the uh, management decision of the companies. I will say this, that some companies trade above fair value consistently due to strategy and execution. So it's important for us to focus on this aspect of the business. This is this is a key to the valuation of a business. So we will know when it's okay to pay fair value for a wonderful company. So for instance, I uh, show here that Johnson & Johnson is, uh, it says as a 1% premium. So the last close was $165. The fair value is $164. So, you know, a value investor might say, ah, it's not time to buy Johnson & Johnson. However, Johnson & Johnson historically is tr- has traded above its fair value. So I got a quote down here at the bottom from Warren Buffett, who says it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. And so I, you know, I'm, Currently, um, I haven't bought Johnson & Johnson in, in a while, but I, I do. I, I am growing that as part of my portfolio. So strategy and execution, big deal. It's a big deal in my philosophy. So let's, let's review these three intersections. You see here that uh, the, this road, the intersections in this road are an intersection between dividend growth investing, which is companies that are growing their dividend every year, value investing, which is looking for companies who are maybe uh, abandoned by the market and they are trading much lower than their intrinsic value. And then companies that have a superb strategy and execution, those that are going to take what the, the value of the company is and they're going to grow that value over time because of their strategic decision making and execution. So the stocks that I'm looking for fall within this red circle. It's that intersection of those three things. Now, I didn't think it would be fair to uh, have this video and not reconcile for some of you the five pillars that I always talk about. So uh, as you can tell, the this chart here is set up to show value, dividend growth investing, and the strategy and execution. But I always talk about five pillars. I talk about having solid financials, and you see that in dividend growth investing. I always talk about having good capital allocation, which you see in dividend growth investing. I always talk about it being fairly valued or lower. That's a part of value investing. And in strategic uh, strategy and execution, I always look for leveraging the brands and positioning the company for growth. So that's part of the strategy and also good decision making. So those are the five pillars that I always talk about when I'm talking about how I select stocks. Just so happens that it is an intersection of all three of these investing strategies. But the real point of this slide is over on the right-hand side. Now, Benjamin Graham said that in the short run, the market acts as a voting machine 
And in the long run, it, it works as a weighing machine. It took me a long time to try and figure out what that really meant. But here's kind of what I think he meant by that. In the short run, a company is going to have, you know, uh, items in the news. And in today's world, they're going to have social media. They're going to have, you know, product performance. They're going to have uh, instant feedback on, uh, you know, in the news on, on CNBC or whatever. So those kinds of things lead to investor momentum, either in a positive direction or a negative direction. And it really has very little to do with the value of the company. It has to do with what the sentiment of investors are at that particular time. So investors are voting based on their sentiment about that company at that particular time. However, in the long run, the value of a company is going to be based on its business performance. So when I'm selecting a stock, my philosophy is that I want to try the best I can to ignore the sentiment, to ignore the voting machine, and to try to pick the companies who are going to be uh, growing the most in the long run. So one of the biggest challenges to my uh, philosophy of investing is the psychology and the emotion of investing. There's a lot of that in this short term, in that voting machine that Benjamin Graham talks about. And so if I can keep my mind away from that and keep it focused on the long term business performance, those are the times that I tend to do much better uh, in terms of investing. So my style of investing is the intersection of dividend growth investing, value investing, and strategy and execution, which really aligns well with the five pillars that I talk about of, you know, fairly valued or lower, solid financials, capital allocation, levering the strategic value of their brands and their services, and then lastly, good decision making. So hopefully that all makes sense and you can see how that all plays together. So I thought I'd give you three examples of companies. Now these three companies are Medtronic, Intel, and 3M. And I apologize, I know this is a bit small and I just found out that I can use a laser pointer here. So it's probably gonna make things a lot better. So this top chart here is Medtronic. And I wanted to show that over time, this uh, company has gone down in value. Uh, and stock price. And I wanted to show you that Intel has a very similar look and 3M has a very similar look. So all of these companies have decreased in value. So many times what you'll hear on YouTube is that, hey, this stock is, uh, you know, 50% off of its highs. You need to look at buying this stock. Well, that's one piece of the equation. But for my philosophy, I'm not just looking at the price. I'm also looking at the value. I'm looking at the management team. I'm looking at their decision making, their financials, and their allocation process. So uh, you can see here, this is Medtronic, Intel, 3M. All of them have gone down. You can also see here that Medtronic, and I'll read this to you if it's too small, Medtronic is at a 21% discount at, at this particular date. Now, Intel was only at a 4% discount to its fair value. And then 3M is at a 17% discount. So, you know, if you just look from a value investing perspective, you would say, hey, you know what, Medtronic and 3M, those are the two that I, you know, that are that are below their fair value. Now, from a dividend growth perspective, you can see here I've put charts that show the dividend growth of, of all three of these companies. Now, I will say that this chart on Intel, for whatever reason, does not show that Intel dropped its dividend by 66%. So that I found that to be interesting that this chart did not have that in there, but their, their uh, dividend is probably going to be down in this range here. It was dropped by two thirds, but up until this point, up until that decision was made, all three of these companies had growing dividends every year for long periods of time up and to the right. So these are the kind of companies that a dividend growth investor would want. So I'm sharing these companies because all three of them are attractive to value investors and they're attractive to dividend growth investors. So what's going to separate those out and why do I only own one of these companies and not all three of these companies? 
Well, it comes in the management uh, piece, the management and the strategy, and that's over here in the right. And it's really subjective, right? So, you know, if I look at historically, uh, Medtronic's focused on innovation, designing and manufacturing devices. Uh, they have cha they've been challenged by post reform uh, reimbursements for next generation technology, and they're slightly changing their strategy to include partnering more closely with their hospital clients. So, I, you know, looks like they they recognize they have an issue. They are, are changing their strategy to try and address that issue. Now, when I come to Intel, now they remain the market share leader in the integrated design and manufacturing of microprocessors found in PCs and servers. Now, TSMC, which is uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, it, it jumped ahead and AMD has leveraged TSMC's strength to build industry-leading x86 CPUs and encroach on Intel's formerly dominant position. The rise of artificial intelligence has also unleashed a new competitor for Intel, which is called NVIDIA. Now, Intel's strategy, which many of you may know, was to double down and to go full bore into both design as well as manufacture of chips. From my perspective, I would rather have seen them focus on one or the other. I don't know that they can be successful um, in both because one takes technology and, well, they both take technology, but one is more about operations. There's a lot of capital intensive, uh, uh, spending when it comes to building these fab plants. The other one is about design. It's about, uh, you know, the people that you hire, it's about, you know, how creative your staff can be in, in getting these chips smaller and smaller and smaller. So those are, the uh, pieces of that Intel's trying to do it all. My position was I really didn't want to see them try to do it all. I wanted to see them try to do one or the other. So I ended up not buying them. Now, when it comes to 3M, they are, uh, they actually have some pretty good uh, proprietary secrets. They are closely held. They have a lot of, of uh, intangible property. And because of that, they typically can charge a price premium related to the products in their market. However, estimating the liabilities surrounding uh, 3M's uh, product, their legal liabilities, there's a, a high uncertainty uh, in that. Uh, Morningstar now believes that 3M is a value trap given their continued exposure to legal liabilities. And there's also a risk of a dividend cut. So because of that, I only invest currently in Medtronic. I believe that all of these, uh, the, I believe that Medtronic, out of the three of these, that Medtronic is the better uh, intersection of those roads that we talked about, not only from a value perspective, not only from a dividend growth perspective, but also from a strategy and management execution perspective. There are a lot of things that, that cause a company to be successful. Strategy and execution is one of those things, but it does improve the probability that if a stock has fallen in price, that they have a better probability of recovering that share price in the long run because they are better equipped to leverage the strategic value of the company in producing value in the long term. So that's what I will say about strategy and execution. And that's why it's a big part of my philosophy. So if you've stayed with me this long, you deserve a short video of some bees that are going a bit out of control. So today we were inspecting the bees and they became pretty active. Actually, I would say more ticked off than active. So after we were finished, normally we go to the barn and we, uh, you know, get into the, the room there and, and there's closed doors so the bees can't get to us. We take our, our uh, outfits off and uh, we or our bee suits or whatever they're called and we, we hang those up. And by the time we get back outside, they're typically dissipated. They're, they're gone. They're back to, you know, getting pollen or whatever they do. And, and however... <laughs> That was not the case today. They sat there and waited on us to come back outside. One actually stung me right on the tip of the nose. I don't know if you can see it or not, 
But uh, I was like, I got to get out of here. These bees are mad. So um, I thought you would enjoy this particular uh, video because it shows you how mad they really were. So take a look. <laughs> So fortunately, only stung one time, so I'm excited about that. But um, anyway, you deserve that video since you stayed with me th this long. So I'm going to put a link to the last video that I did on portfolio update. Also put a link to uh, subscribing to the channel over on this side. If you would take a look at this portfolio and tell me whether you think there's a, a company or some companies that fall outside of that intersection, that round red circle that we talked about earlier. I would really appreciate that discussion. So, you know, we grow every day and as dividend investors, it is about helping each other. And so if you would take a look at that, it would really help me out a lot. I would love that conversation. So with that, I will see you on the next video.